Welcome to Mysteries of Superstition Mountain. I'm Larry Hedrick, where we bring the past into the present for our future viewers. Today, we have another great story by Hank Sheffer. Well, you know, there are a number of different treasure and lost gold legends that draw searchers and visitors to our area all the time, right here to the mysterious superstitions. And that's every year, year after year after year. Unfortunately, for those who come here to search for treasure, when that happens, there are a certain number of things that happen to all of them. Now, after all the planning is done and they've got all their stuff put together, what they're gonna take with them, off they go into the desert or into the mountain, wherever they're gonna go looking for this treasure, whatever it may be. And we're gonna assume that they got lucky and they found something. Well, unfortunately, there are several things that happen to people who have found treasure, and it happens to every one of them. Let's pretend a treasure having been found is followed by something that comes about whereby the treasure itself is rendered back into the wonderful world of the lost. There's a cave in. You bumped your head and you forgot where it was. You succumbed to the environmental climate because you were not smart enough to not venture into the desert in Arizona during July or August. And my all time favorite, besides all of the above, is the nasty old Indians covered it up. So that's what happens. Well, now that you've had that problem, you have another problem and you have to consider the options there. You're now forced to either say nothing about what you found, which is probably not gonna happen, or you simply deal with the reality of knowing that even though you did manage to find something, now you're trapped in the ubiquitous dark place called trying to prove it. And there you sit. You can't prove it, you know you found it, but you bumped your head and all that, so you're in trouble. You can't do anything with it. Of course, now that gives you another situation because you're put into another category of people and you fall under this thing that is a tired old ungracious description that was made by some old crusty fiction writer about the above hapless neophytes. That's you with your bumped head and you can't find the thing. And this is what he said, and I'm gonna read it to you so I don't get the words wrong. He said, the superstition mountains are full of a gun-happy cranks, full of truculent treasure hunters, who are from faraway cities. And there are all sorts of unreliable freaks, misfits, and oddballs, who are all attracted by the fame of the name of the place, of all things. They come here to do nothing more than live out their childhood fantasies, that deal with the old Wild West and maybe find treasure. And that's what he said. So there you have it. As you, my loyal w listeners, have probably already figured out, the aftermath of a hunt is usually infinitely worse than the original search was to start with. And we're gonna move on and talk about some really interesting treasure hunting stuff. For years, storytellers have talked about lost Spanish Jesuit missions in the Apicheria and Primeria. Our focus is on the nearly two dozen missions established by Father Kino in the Primera regions of southern Arizona and northern Sonora, Mexico. It's important to know he established both missions and vistas. And for those of you who don't know the difference, a church mission was something that was permanently established and had a priest that went with it, uh, or a padre, if you will. Vistas were temporary sites, and more often than not, they were just used to conduct marriages and baptisms and other religious ceremonies, just business of the church, but they weren't actually a church per se. March 13 of 1687, Father Eusebio Francisco Quino traveled to Cucurpe, in Sonora, northern Mexico. He established his first mission and named it 
Nuestra Señora de los Dolores, which means Our Lady of Sorrows. That's like starting on a positive note. At that time, the Primera Alta, and Primera means it comes from Pima. And if you hadn't figured it out, the Apacheria came from Apache. At any rate, the Primera Alta included the northern portion of Mexican state of Sonora and the land south of the Gila River. That is specifically where the Jesuits are credited with building all their missions. These same lands became part of the Gadsden Persians after the Mexican-American War in 1848. That's not real important right now, but that's what happened. History tells us that many Mexican and Pima families lived along the San Pedro and Santa Cruz rivers by the early 1800s, and that there were several farming communities along the San Pedro, Santa Cruz, and Gila rivers by 1825. Some of the inhabitants prospected and worked at a limited mining north of the Gila River. But even so, historical records categorically tell us that there were no Spanish missions established north of the Gila River. This is important for all of the hunters who keep saying that this all had something to do with Jacob Waltz and his gold, because it didn't. Now, having said that, I have to admit that I am guilty. I, too, have heard stories about lost Spanish missions and treasures located in the superstitions. Furthermore, some folks ardently believed there was a mission located near the old Henry Barnes Ranch, just off Peralta Road near the Quarter Circle U, uh, Quarter Circle U Ranch. Now, as the stories would go, old Henry claimed he found the mission's treasure and buried it right there on his place. He swore the mission did exist and that the priest had a rich gold mine in the Superstition Mountains. Now, don't you see, that's the way the storyteller would have told it. Unfortunately, Henry and his wife also claimed that they were friends with UFO aliens who often visited them and often offered to take them to another world anytime they wanted to go. Makes you really want to go look for that mission, doesn't it? So there you go. You just have to take that for what it's worth. Well, old Henry eventually died. We're not sure where he went. But we do know that Helen remained on the property for a time. Well, gang, she lasted until the late 1960s when Robert Crazy Jake Jacob showed up on the scene. Now, Crazy Jake, too, was claiming there was a church mission located on the Burns Ranch property. Never let it be said there was ever a dull moment when Crazy Jake was around. And boy, oh boy, this go-round was no different. One day, Crazy Jake drove out to the property to visit Helen and pick up some of his old stuff that he'd left there on the, on the ranch. Apparently, he was living there for a while. While there, Helen decided to commit suicide. She shot herself in the head. Fortunately for Jake, the autopsy cleared him of all possible wrongdoing. And now why he should have been responsible for the wrongdoing, we really don't know, other than the fact that there was a mission that maybe had gold in, well, whatever. Or maybe he just had that effect on women, <laughs> I don't know. Now we see another familiar name show up. A good old friend of Burns, Robert Bob Ward. He told the story of how he authenticated the Jesuit treasure was that, Gen that uh, Henry had and established he had about 90 pounds of gold bullion, not to mention crosses and artifacts stamped with the Jesuit cross. Ward often talked about the nearby Jesuit church and the site where its church bell was found on Queen Creek, about a thousand yards where the so-called stone maps were discovered in 1949. Bob said the bell was marked with the name of the church, but you ready for it? He couldn't recall what the name was. The next occupant of the Burns Ranch was 
Chuck Crawford. He too was convinced that the old mission was actually a large gold mining operation. And he knew exactly where the Spanish dug their gold. Of course he did. He and Bob both pointed out the gold molds near Borrego Mountain, which is Black Mountain, south of where the mission was supposed to have been. These holes were actually Native American grind holes used to crush beans and seeds for the desert food that they ate. Whatever they were, they certainly were not gold ingot molds. These grind holes can be found all over the Southwest. To be clear, gold is usually cast in sand molds, not molds of solid rock. That just didn't happen. Chuck and Bob spun some pretty spectacular tales, by golly. Unfortunately, they all too often link true facts with not so true facts, just to make their story seem feasible. And right along with them were all the ambulance chaser newspaper writers looking for any kind of sensational stories that would help sell papers. Today, there are very few treasure hunters who actually believe the Jesuits had a mission in the Superstition Mountains, not the ones who have done any reading and have any sense at all anyway. There is just too much documentable evidence saying that they didn't exist. On the other hand, that is not to say the Jesuits did not leave treasures for us to see and explore. More often than not, they're right in front of our noses. They're just overlooked because they're not what we seem to think they should be. Now to bring this all together, let me tell you a little bit about this man, Father Kino. His legacy has truly been a deeply rooted influence on Arizona and her difficult adolescent years. Father Kino was born in 1645 in Segno, Italy. He was a Jesuit missionary, geographer, explorer, cartographer, and astronomer. He also was the first to the Primavera Alta in March of 1687 and established that first mission we talked about in Sonora the Nuestra Senora de los Dolores. From that time is when he established all those missions in northern Mexico and southern Arizona, including San Xavier del Bac, Quavavi, and Tumacacori. Kino traveled extensively. He made more than 40 expeditions on horseback and covered over 50,000 square miles. This included his visit to what is now the Casa Grande Grand Hohokam Ruins, the National Monument. During those travels, he mapped, that's what cartographers do if you didn't know, he mapped an area of 200 miles long and 250 miles wide on his own. Kino's maps were the most accurate maps of the region for more than 150 years until after his death in 1711. That means they were being used well into the 19th century. Moreover, many of today's geographical features, including the Colorado River, were first named by Father Kino. Kino was a tremendous influence to the economic growth of the area as well. He worked side by side with the indigenous agrarian native people who were already here. He introduced them to European seeds and fruits and herbs and grains, things they'd never seen before. It is tremendously interesting to me that he has also taught them to raise livestock, cattle, sheep, and goats. Kino's initial herd <laughs> of 20 mission cattle imported to Pomeria Alto grew during his 24 tenure. By the time he died, those 20 cattle had grown to 70,000 head. Some historians even refer to Father Kino as Arizona's first cattle rancher. That may be a reach, but it makes sense. And while he was doing all that, he also was responsible for building some of the most beautiful missions ever built. Unfortunately, there are only a very few that have survived. 
San Xavier del Buc down near the old Pueblo. That's Tucson for you folks who may not know. Stands as a testament to his many accomplishments. Founded in 1692, San Xavier is the oldest Catholic church in the United States still serving the community for which it was built. Contrary to local legends and stories, there is no Jesuit treasure to be found in the Superstition Mountains, simply because the Jesuits never built missions north of the Gila River. In the final analysis, from my personal point of view, Father Kino made all of our lives so much simpler when it comes to searching for lost treasure. That is, if you still have a mind to do that sort of thing. In the first place, you don't have to take your life into your hands trying to seek out a treasure wandering around the treacherous mountains and canyons of the vast superstition mountains. And two, even better, if you do manage to find something, you won't have to worry about forgetting its location or enduring the humiliation of trying to explain what you forgot. Best of all, you won't fall into that, that last category we talked about, folks, by getting yourself labeled as one of those gun-happy, cranks, truculent treasure hunters or unreliable misfit oddball freaks. Just go visit San Savior Mission and the Casa Grande ruins if you want. They are amazing treasures to see and behold, and you'll save yourself a whole lot of grief. And lastly, how so much of the other lost whatever it is stuff got started is anybody's guess. To me, it's simply a whole lot easier to just say it's one more of the mysteries of the Superstition Mountain. Thank you for watching this episode of Mysteries of the Superstition Mountains. 